I, I, for those of you who haven't met me, which is none of you, I, I'm Francis Watson. I'm one of the co-organizers of the R&T program. So I, I won't thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to talk about uh, some dynamic reconstruction problems in SAR. Um, so just a quick overview of my talk. I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the SAR data model, um, about image formation and reconstruction, uh, before moving on to the sort of main rest of the talk, which is on dynamic reconstruction, targets moving in the scene, um, and a long track motion focusing in SAR. If I stand right here, I get a horrible little echo, which I think encourages me out here. I think only I can hear it. Anyway, so some disclaimers I want to make before I start. So, um, I guess the, my aim for this talk was to help continue the discussion that I've been starting this week between the, the volume's on, right? It's it's all on here. Yeah. That's the microphone, right? Are you echoing it on your laptop? Ah probably. Okay. There we go. All right, so maybe they'll filter that out when they put it on YouTube. <laughs> So, a couple of disclaimers. Um, I guess the, I wanted to give this talk this week uh, to help with the discussions between mathematicians and SAR engineers. Um, so, hopefully, it lands somewhere between between the two. Um, so, on the other hand, maybe that just means that there are aspects of the talk that are disappointing to all parties, right? So, I'm not using any any real data in SAR. Um, on the other hand, sometimes I'm maybe taking more of an engineering approach, that there, there are some elements that could be made more rigorous, some uh, new mathematical directions to look at, and, and we'll come back to that. Okay. So we're talking about synthetic aperture radar, and um, I don't have a nice graphic like some of the talks that I've So we're going to say that these waves are governed by the scalar wave equation. Um, now, obviously, they're not really. They're governed by Maxwell's equations. Uh, so I, I quite like a term that Joshua used uh, last week, or possibly the week before, to describe this. So, so we're going to call this the sarcoustic data model. Um, we're going to pretend that everything's governed by the scalar wave equation. So okay, that's OK in free space for each polarization. That's, that's fine when there's no interactions, but obviously something different will happen when we, when these waves interact with the sea. <coughs> um, and we're looking for reflections from our receiver, and we're going to say that those are reflections caused by perturbations in the wave speed from some constant background, so this scene or is the speed of light. Um, and we're going to assume that this reflectivity function U non-zero only on some surface that we're trying to image, which we may as well call x3 equals zero. Um, equally, we could think about imaging directly onto some known terrain. Okay. So the pulse that we transmit into free space, um, so that just travels through the air, so that, um, so that satisfies a, a, a wave equation with a constant sound speed. Um, and we're going to write then the, the total wave field that we, we could measure as the incident field plus some um, scattered field. And, and I suppose it's, it's the scattered field that we care about in radar. So this scattered field will satisfy um, these equations. So the, the, the equation that the total field satisfies 
um, minus this second equation. And if we subtract those and, and do a bit of rearranging, then we get another wave equation out. Um, and here we have this, uh, the total field appears in, in as part of the source term now. Okay, and we can, we can rewrite this in, in integral form. Um, and, of course, we can write it in the frequency domain. And here I've just included the degrees one explicitly. Um, and what we should note is that the scatter field appears both inside and outside of the integral, um, which means that the, the thing that we're measuring, the scatter field, varies non-linearly with the reflectivity. Um, and if this is something that you particularly are interested in solving about, then I'm just uh, I'm just going to point you to our sister program, Multiple Wave Scattering, whose uh, first workshop is on this week. Okay. So ideally, we want something not nonlinear. Um, so one of the things we could start to do is expand this as a as a Neumann series. Um, so obviously, we also need to be careful about where we think that will converge. Uh, so here, the, the first term, so this is the east of the point field. I don't know if anyone can do something about the line on the screen. Which one? It's the sun coming through a gap over there. So the first term is just the incident field <coughs> scattered once. And then the second term in the series on the right hand side is this scattered field and then that re scattered again and on and on and on. So what we will do is we'll say let's let's assume that everything is only reflected once um, and then we just take the first term in this series and, and that's called the forward point. Now that a model for our scattered field uh, <coughs> only has the incident field reflected once. There's no rescattering. We assume that everything's simple. Okay. And okay, we're we're saying that we're just looking at a flat scene, um, so maybe that's okay. Um, not always, but but hopefully we just get one reflection back to the radar. Okay. What are we going to do next? Well, we're going to take a start-stop approximation. What does that mean? Uh, we're going to assume that our, our radar pulse travels so quickly at the speed of light compared to everything else that the field is approximately stationary. Everything else is stationary. The, the radar hasn't moved between the pulse being emitted and the reflections being received. Okay? And we've described this already. At flow time s, the transmitter is at gamma t of s. Um, and for a point light -like antenna, we have the incident field is, is just like a mul some multiple of the of the Green's function, um, and then with a receiver at gamma r of s, which may be the same as gamma t, we simply <coughs> plug this into the previous equation. Um, uh, then we get some uh, time delayed and, and reflected signals. Okay. So that's not quite our data. We're going to record in phase and quadrature IQ data, um, and we're, we're going to do that such that if there was a scatterer at some reference point, then our data um, for that scatterer, which let's call the origin, um, has zero phase. What does that mean? That means we're going to um, mix our received um, wave field with some reference signal for this point. Um, okay. So this is a little bit of a simplification, but uh, what we end up with now, um, instead of the exponentials um, originally having 
a large range in it. Now it has a different difference of two ranges, a differential range, um, and I've just simplified the, the sum of the, the bistatic two-way range effectively in, uh, into this R. Uh, have you used the, the X3 restricted to a plane at this point, or is that? Uh, I've, 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 at this point, you can still call it whatever you like. Yeah, it's just a, a single scattering approximation is a little bit dubious if the scattering wave actually has to go through some special stuff. But yeah, exactly. It, it, so it's not exactly suited to this maybe in that case, but yeah. the stuff was sort of both barren. <coughs> So the, the the question was whether I've at this point assumed um, that the imaging plane is X free if that makes a difference, and that, so the answer is no. The, the derivation is the same. I'm, I'm just calling the surface uh, X free equals naught, for example, um, and it sort of only matters if you're imaging through things uh, because that's when the board approximation is, is going to be bad. Okay, um, and of course this is something that we can, we can sample at, at lower frequency, um, so effectively we've, we've got something centered around zero frequency now, so whereas our radar might be operating at 9 or 10 gigahertz, we, we don't need to sample at you know, 20 gigahertz, we now just need to sample for the bandwidth of the signal. Okay, so now we discretize this, so let's assume the scene is made up of a, some distribution of point scatterers on our grid, so on our grid x3 equals naught, for example. Um, and then this gives some discretized data model, which we can write as a, um, using linear algebra. Um, and now let's just summarize some assumptions that we've made so far in building this model. So firstly, we've used a scalar wave model. We've assumed single scattering. Here, we've assumed isotropic point scatterers. And we've made a start-stop approximation. So some of these things are, are not going to hold up very well, um, depending, on, uh, depending on our application, the data we collect, the scene we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. So the so the start the start stop approximation is it, it's really about assuming that your radar hasn't moved or or isn't moving as you record the data. Uh, oh, right. Right, right, right. Right. Yeah. So it's come off the Right. So 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 if you have something moving very fast, then you know a, a really fast moving aircraft, uh, then it's still going to be slow, but you can measure the change. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Right. Yeah, like an old school radar, if it's going at a, con oops, at a constant angular velocity, um, rather than stop, have a look at that, and then start up again. Right? So it's kind of going jerk, like a stepper motor. Uh, so the radar antenna won't go in jerks like a stepper motor, but you yeah. could you could model it that way because it's not. Continuously emitting, right? It's, it's, uh, it's impulses, off and, off. And, and we've got off and on pulses here. Pulse so if you had a continuous off. wave radar, you mm -hmm. know, if you were continuously emitting a sine wave, say, yeah. okay. then then this model wouldn't work at all. You you'd only be measuring, um, you'd only be measuring the, the Doppler shift essentially. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, another yeah. question just got my head. Is it, what's, the wavelength? what's the wavelength? Okay. I, I, <laughs> um, how, how long is a piece of string? Okay, so I mean, you can do synthetic aperture radar from, you know, uh, uh, yeah, I, I guess, from, yeah. So down to millimeters, yeah. yeah. So where it's waves. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I also wanted to make a throwaway statement, and, and this kind of this kind of builds on some of our discussions 
or, or links to some of our discussions yesterday, um, where we asked, so Bill asked what the image formation actually is. Um, and, and here I'm just going to say all star image formation is application of an adjoint operator. And, and I'm obviously being a bit facetious. In other words, for mathematicians, that's a back projection. On the other hand, back projection means a specific time domain algorithm generally, um, if, if you're from a, a SAR engineering perspective. So, so there's a bit of a language shift there um, in, in terms of just what people think. It's a time domain adjoint, right? Exactly. So it's a time domain adjoint, right? It's, it's the adjoint of a time domain formulation of, of the model, right? Um, often, uh, I, I guess sometimes it's called the fast back projection algorithm, where you've got fast interpolation in there. But yep. So on that, <laughs> many many formulations. So uh, as Malcolm said. Many are, are sort of geared to use uh, um, FFTs so that you can do things really fast, or, or uh, maybe they're more geared towards having a very accurate adjoint operator, um, such as a match filter. Okay. Uh, but here we're thinking about uh, tomographic approaches to reconstruction. Um, and obviously, despite my throwaway comment, there is a lot of research in this area for SAR. It's not actually all back projection, um, especially a large body of literature on compressive sensing. Uh, but we're, we're thinking about um, reconstruction problems where we want to find some model parameters for the reflectivity in the scene, which would best reproduce the data, as well as fit some prior knowledge. Does that have? Yeah. So when you say tomographic reconstruction, you mean that type of variation? I, I mean, variational approaches, but maybe some other as well. Yeah, or, or, or somehow higher dimensional. Uh, or, or we might be interested in something higher dimensional, right? Because we're the rich and non-linear. <coughs> but, but that word topographic here means variation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah, maybe that's a, just another sort of language <coughs> language thing between, between disciplines. Okay. You mean, as, as in the types of approaches that are used on things called tomography? Exactly. It's yeah. Well, I mean, <coughs> people are always saying tomography means place reconstruction. Yeah, yeah, and then they, <laughs> then they do something else. <coughs> like, we do something yeah, I, I didn't really catch that. There's a lot of content going on. Like, it's <laughs> very <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. Um, so I, I, I guess maybe the, the um, I think the answer is just yes, I'm, I'm using the term sort of uh, quite loosely here, right, okay. in, 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 in a way to sort of link to the, the RNT program, but more, more than uh, to say that it has to be a slice. Although, although I, I think I quite often find in SAR when people say tomographic approaches, they're doing a 3D reconstruction, right? So yeah, it all sounds more generally. Yeah. Some do routine, uh, like more yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, so, of course, in particular for our program, we're interested in rich tomography, so where the data is multidimensional, so that might be multi-static or interferometric SAR data in this case, and, and where we want to measure or reconstruct something that's not just a scalar. Um, and we're interested in nonlinear tomography where uh, in, in the same formulation, so this forward operator A would somehow depend non very nonlinearly um, with some of the some of the parameters. Okay. So I, I'm not going to say much about um, how you solve these methods. What I'm just going to do instead is, is give a nod to the CCPy core image library, um, which gives a sort of generic framework and 
hyphen toolbox for reconstruction and, and while it's focused on x-ray CT problems, it's quite easy to set up uh, for anything else and, and that includes a, a range of regularization approaches such as total variation, edge preserving methods and a, and a suite of optimization schemes which are well maintained and, and nicely val validated and verified um, including for these non-smooth problems. And, and I guess the reason is it's easy for developers like me to quickly get going because you don't have to do everything. You've got a whole suite of algorithms. You can just try your bit of the problem. You just need to describe this uh, this operator A um, in some predefined way. Um, and then, of course, it's easy for users because you have a nice abstracted interface where you can just write something down that looks like that equation um, that you want to solve and try a solver for it. So what does that end up looking like? Well, it's very simple. It's obviously not great always to put code on the screen, but I just wanted to highlight how easy it is. Um, here, so I, this first line sets up the, the system matrix. So I've made the class that does, that, that describes these system matrices for SAR, the data model, and just give it some information about the geometry of the scene, so how big it is, where your pixels are, the geometry of your data, so where these flight paths are. Um, you have some data and you set up, a, for example, a least squares data misfit. You say, I would like total variation regularization. Um, <coughs> you, you have an initial condition, you pick a solver, and you tell it to go. And hey presto, you get an image. So uh, I, I suppose the reason to highlight this is, is we have sort of a, a real mix of disciplines here. So if you're interested in these kinds of methods, you don't have to learn everything about them. You kind of need to learn just, just enough so that you know what does total variation mean? You know, what kind of regularization do I need? Roughly what sort of ballpark of parameters might, might work? What, which set of solvers actually are valid for my problem? Um, but you don't need to get to grips with all the analysis behind them that sort of proves they work or, or when they don't. Okay, so just a very quick example. Um, so as I said, uh, there's no real data in this talk, and I guess we saw last week um, from Marco Iglesias why, as mathematicians, we like to start not working with real data uh, because you end up just testing your forward model more than the algorithm uh, before that can actually reproduce your data well enough. So here's just some simulated data for some, some point scatterers in a scene arranged in little clusters of targets um, on a background of, of uh, speckle data. Um, so on the right, this is the, the data Fourier transformed into the time domain. So we have fast time going up, and that's just the index of the pulse number, uh, sorry, the, the index of the pulse sample of the received signal. and going across is the index of the pulse number, so that's how we move across the synthetic aperture in time. Okay, and, and you can kind of make out some, some structure uh, from, the, from the targets against the background clutter. Fast times proportional to the range? Yes, yeah, fast times proportional to the range, yeah. One's a surrogate to the other. 10.7 degrees is what? Okay, so just some quick examples then. Um, the back projected image on the left, and obviously you see all this, uh, this cluster in the background, and a total variation regularized reconstruction on the right, and because that penalizes oscillatory changes, it likes things to be made up of um, piecewise smooth <coughs> materials, it, it, it suppresses that cluster. 
Okay, well, this is just a quick example. It, there's nothing really new there, but it was just to kind of show how, how easy it, it can be to uh, try some of these ideas out. What we're really interested in is uh, dynamic problems in SAR. So if we have, let's think about um, the monostatic case where our transmitter and receiver are in the same place. If we have a target moving this way, then as on the left image, we'll find that it blurs. And if you think about any other um, any other reconstruction problem, if, if things are moving around as you collect the data over time, then you can expect it to blur. If it's moving towards or away from the radar zone in SAR, it doesn't defocus at all. Instead, you find it focused up perfectly, but shifted in, in the cross-range direction. So I, I'm going to leave that as a as a homework exercise, you can convince yourself of this quite easily. If you plot in, in MATLAB or your favorite software, the range over time to a stationary point in a scene as you fly past, and then you plot the, the same thing with that point moving directly towards or away the line that you're traveling, um, you, you, you should easily see the you get the same response as a point just shifted across. Only for a straight line. For, for a straight line trajectory and constant velocity. Yes, yeah. 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 Sure. Right, and that's about measuring the, oh, that's so the Doppler the shift, right? The, the so, 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 so Malcolm made the point only for a linear chirp, and and if your signal isn't a linear chirp, then you'll lose gain instead. Yeah. Yeah. So it so it measures the the, the phase shift in in as the phase shift across rather than the Doppler shift up, yeah. right? If you yeah. plot it. Yeah. then you do measure the Doppler shift, yeah. Okay, but you'll still see, if, if you have a nonlinear chirp, you'll still see some displacement effects, right? Yes, the displacement effect will be over the Okay. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe you can, Bill. Maybe you can be in charge of where the yeah, microphone yeah, yeah. is. Like, I was just thinking, Margaret. Yeah. Has anyone else? Okay. So, sorry. This motion is due to the geometry, the equivalent geometry of something moving. Not because you can't measure. Not due to the Doppler effect of the thing moving towards. Yeah. Or, or a linear chirp, as Malcolm pointed out, you don't measure the Doppler shift due to it moving towards you. Or, it's out, or it would have to be moving quite fast to measure that effect, not right? A, so it's not a Doppler phenomenon. Because we have a wide band signal, a wide band, specifically a chirp in SAR, it's hard to measure that. Is, is, should I move on? Or, or, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so just, just applying the same the same methods as before, so uh, thinking now specifically about the along track motion and, and focusing that up. So the problem we get here is some defocusing. So in the back projection, um, you can, you can it, 
it's quite clear we not only lose uh, potentially the ability to tell what this object is, but we lose um, signal to clutter or signal to noise ratio as, as it's been spread out in time, and we might not see it at all against, against the background. Um, and the, the TV regularized image is not a lot better. Maybe it's better to see against the clutter, but you still can't tell what, what these targets are. Okay, so we're not we're not going to think about the ambiguous problem of, of things moving in the range direction here because at least they focus up. For the rest of the talk, we're going to think about uh, focusing things that are moving in the same direction that you're moving your radar. Okay, so as as Malcolm showed us yesterday, one of the things you could do to see that you have a moving target and, and that that's why it's not focusing up is to just take sub apertures of your images. And, and move along, and you can see these things move then. But of course, by doing that, you lose some resolution in the cross-range direction because we've got less data, effectively. We've got a short aperture for each of these images. So maybe there's some balance where you, can't, you still can't tell what this, what this target is. It's not blurred so much anymore, but you've not got enough resolution on it that you can't tell. Um, again, what about uh, a TV reconstruction? So in this case, the total variation is in time as well. Um, so in, it's saying there, are, there should be small changes, but, or there should not be too many changes between um, in the X and Y direction as well as between image frames. And OK, maybe some of these frames look a bit better, but again, um, there's some loss of resolution, and, and some of them are some of them are not very helpful at all in working out what's there. Okay, so this suggests an approach, though, uh, where we might want to divide our data set into a sequence of images, um, which we're just going to call a video, call a video, um, and return to our variational approach, where now we have some velocity that we want to solve for as well. We want to know what the motion is. And we want some joint regularization term which somehow enforces sensible motion uh, in the scene for, for something that we can, for, for sensible to be defined. So one example where there's uh, some recent progress is using an optical flow constraint to describe what sensible means. So there's a couple of references there um, where uh, I suppose the inspiration is really drawn from. So what is optical flow? Well, it's, it's a linearization of a um, conservation of brightness condition. Um, it, it's used a lot in things like video processing. Um, discretizing uh, this optical flow constraint and, and incorporating it as a penalty, uh, you can see we can gain this uh, this regularization term which penalizes differences between frames which somehow don't match a given velocity term. Okay, so if, if, the, if things move in a nice smooth way and you have a velocity which is nice and smooth, then, then this regularization term will be small. Okay, so uh, on the other hand, it will penalize changes between frames which, are, which provide unrealistic changes. So it's not going to let objects jump around the scene and things sort of appear and disappear. And you can solve this with a, a biconvex optimization scheme, um, alternating between uh, your image parameter u and the velocity of v. Yeah, photoacoustic gets the name check. Okay, let's think quickly back to the SAR model, though. Um, so for slowly moving targets, and, and as we just had a, a sort of brief interlude, we're not going to measure a Doppler shift. We can consider the scene frozen during a pulse, um, so we can still sort of include this start-stop approximation and, and ignore Doppler shifts. Um, but of course, each of these image frames is still going to be made up of multiple pulses. 
and motion within a frame, an image frame, so between these pulses in, in the same set, is still going to cause phase changes um, in the data, which is still going to cause some defocusing of our image. Uh, so let's just go back to our model and, and we put a distribution of point scatterers down. And one thing we could allow is that now these point scatterers are moving with our velocity. So um, we know the, the velocity at a point in space, then between each pulse, that point scatterer is going to move. Okay. So now our forward operator is, is nonlinear in the, um, and we've assumed that this velocity is going to be constant in, in each of these image frames of our video. Okay, so now our reconstruction problem is going to be nonlinear in velocity, hopefully mildly for slowly moving along track motion. Um, so if our frames are short enough, we're not going to see too much nonlinearity. Um, so slow moving or short frames are kind of equivalent. Um, if you took a long frame, then you would have have had a lot of motion dur during that image chip. Right? It's, it's kind of so swapping, swapping time for speed. Um, so if we had too short an image frame, then our resolution will be too coarse, and that might hamper our ability to estimate V. Um, so previous discretizations of optical flow also may work poorly for SAR. Um, so in the just going back to this model here, uh, this is a center difference, finite difference approximation, discretization to the um, optical flow constraint. Now, that might not work very well in SAR, and I found that it doesn't work for my noddy simulated images, and if it doesn't work for the noddy simulated images, it probably won't work very well on real data. And, and the reason is we've got lots of point-like oscillatory high-frequency stuff in a SAR image. Um, you don't see nice flat things between pixels in general. You don't see nice constant, um, constant areas of, of one reflectivity. So when we take a center difference, we're going to be skipping over and skipping over reflectors as we go. Um, we also have sparse solid body motion, not smooth deformation, as has been seen in some of the other applications of optical flow and dynamic tomography. So we'll have a small number of, say, vehicles which are driving um, and not objects which are deforming, um, for example, in some uh, mechanical process. Um, we also have some com some complications uh, due to the fact that we've got complex imagery. So the, the phase of each of these sub-aperture images in our video will be different. So if we take differences between image frames in, in a finite difference, approximation, we're, we're going to be seeing the difference in phases, so that's not very helpful. Um, so maybe we want to work with absolute valued imagery and, and apply uh, a brightness consistency condition to absolute images. On the other hand, if we can stay working with complex valued images, then it means we can get some coherent combinations. So if you sum, if you took this stack of, of images in our frame, if you keep them as complex valued images, if you sum them all up, you just get back the image you would have formed if you'd taken the whole data set for the back projection. So we also want to stay working with complex images. Okay, so what's the possible solution? Well, for an iteration solving U, so an outer iteration, we're going to alternate between solving for U and V, we're going to apply the brightness consistency condition directly to complex images. So remember, I said the brightness consist the optical flow is a linearization of the brightness consistency condition. So we're not going to linearize that. We're going to say that the next frame is, is some warping of a previous frame. 
So discretizing the brightness consistency condition, we can write this warping um, as, an in, as, a, as an interpolation scheme, and, and here I'm going to use cubic interpolation. Um, and the other thing I've done differently here to the reference made earlier is I'm going to work with a, a two norm here, not a one norm. And the reason is the gradient of this regularization term is then going to be summing across the sub-aperture. Okay? And as, as we just said, if you sum these images, you get a coherent, coherent combination because they're complex values. So for each outer iteration in reflectivity, we now have a variational problem to solve. So we've got a given velocity estimation, which let's start with a, a zero velocity field everywhere. Because if nothing's moving, then we, great, we just solve this one thing. Um, and we'll hopefully end up with a, a video with no motion in it. Um, and again, not really going into any detail about the optimization scheme, other than to say I'm using the primal dual hybrid, hybrid gradient method, the, the default implementation in cell. Sorry, it's not linear, though, right? So it's so this problem oh. is linear in U, right? In right, because V is fixed. And then you just you, so the thing that in cell the primal dual hybrid gradient is meant to solve. Uh, a linear inverse form with a TV. So you just fix B for the moment and call it. That's right, yeah. So, yeah. so here B is fixed. Um, PDHG can solve that with TV being the, the non smooth term mm -hmm. in this case. Okay. So then. Moving to estimate B, so now we've got an update of U. We've got some images. Maybe there's some corruption between them. We did our initial velocity estimation was wrong, um, but we focused up some parts. Now we want to come up with a better estimate of velocity. So we're going to work with the absolute values of the imagery, so we're not sort of dominated by just phase changes due to having a different a different part of the data collection. Um, going to apply a sort of standard off-the-shelf detection thresholding um, method to find the locations of anything that might be moving. Um, and then we're going to apply a sparse optical flow method rather than solving the uh, equivalent variational problem um, to find just of these small number of moving things, um, an estimate of the velocity uh, using a, a local neighborhood average. And then we're going to restrict the velocity to the long track direction because we're only trying to focus up the long track motion. So, for instance, for each iteration, you optimize the entire video? For each iteration, so like in this iteration for you, you optimize the entire video? Yeah. And then you would optimize the entire video of V? Yeah. Okay. When you reconstruct the V, you don't minimize the norm of V? No. Okay. I mean, because if you would minimize, then the last would be there. Yeah, so I, I've, I've taken the nonlinear problem out, out of this framework. Um, so there's, there's a lot of star literature already um, trying to find the motion between frames and, and estimate the velocity. So I, I'm more or less pulling out something fairly off the shelf. So this is where I say um, that point at the beginning, right? There will be aspects that I've taken more of an engineering approach and find a fa found a thing that works. And, and this is definitely one of them. Right? So I found that solving for velocity in this framework, uh, in, in this variational framework, because of the problems I outlined, it, it just really isn't helpful. Um, whereas actually you can get quite a good velocity estimate just by finding things that have moved between frames and estimating the displacement between them and then 
that's in the wrong track of us. Okay, so just an overview of what that looks like. We're going to start with a, some initial estimate of the velocity and the reflectivity, which I guess is going to be all zeros for everything. We're going to, given our estimate of velocity, solve for, um, find, find our, our video um, of reflectivities. Then we're going to run this um, detection and thresholding estimation of velocity. And then we'll rerun, form a new set of images. Hopefully that will sharpen up anything that's moved. We can get a better reconstruction of them, estimate their velocity better, and go around and, until we find something we're happy with. And I guess I found that two or three iterations of this outer loop is all you really need. So now here's some results. So it's the same data set, but now I've divided it into 10 non-overlapping sub-apertures. Um, we'll just run, run through these. Um, so hopefully you can see that there's almost no resolution on the left here. But on the right, the reconstruction result, uh, we're skipping through quite soon. Yeah, so it is moving slowly. I can see it on my screen. On the projector, it's not a bit less obvious that things move. Okay. And there's some delay between me pressing the button and it actually happening. Okay. I don't know. The the sort of half engineer in me is is kind of quite satisfied by the the sort of resolution. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> it worked, and when I tried it with other things, it also worked, right? So everything focuses up quite nicely. Whereas the mathematician is trying to break it. Yeah. Well, I found lots of broken versions and converged in on what worked, right? <laughs> um, and also, just to say that in this simulation, it, it's not a constant velocity. There, there is some small amount of uh, acceleration, and, and the estimation of velocity or, or speed is, is sort of a right as well. Can I just check? You're not really thinking of velocity as a, as a useless variable, are you? You might be interested in the velocity because it might help you recognize what the target was. So is the velocity a nuisance variable? Uh, I suppose in, in this formulation, it kind of is a nuisance parameter. Um, but in a lot of applications of SAR, you might only be looking for some things that are moving, potentially. Or, or you might be particularly interested in anything that's moving um, because you might be looking somewhere that if there's something moving there, it's probably interesting, right? As long as it's not a motorway, then you probably want to get rid of all the moving stuff. Yeah. So do I know why why there's a systematic error in the acceleration is the question. So it may be that if I allowed this to run for some more iterations that it would converge. Um, what? So yes, and it's a thing that's uh, quite hard to, for me at least, to wrap my brain around. And, and maybe we can have a more of a discussion with Malcolm and, and, and Dan. Um, the amount of displacement you see, so the amount of blurring, is something like two times the velocity. Right, which I so it's got a bit of uncertainty on it. Yeah, um, that's if you formed an image with a zero velocity. So as you get an estimation of velocity, that should come down to the right amount of blurring and displacement between frames. Um, so that's kind of the nonlinearity. Uh, so that's that's where that um, that bias and acceleration. I and of course, that, that's the slightly faster moving target. So that's probably where it's come out. Maybe if I ran for another iteration here, that would just flat off. Um, but I'm also lazy, so I didn't. Uh, does it take a long time to run? Uh, it doesn't take too long. It, it takes n times how many reconstructions you do, right? For how many, half, where n is the number of iterations. So, you know, I, on this laptop, I can just leave it and, and get these results. I think for a real SAR data set, it might be quite big, quite a long, lot of com computation. But <coughs> you've only got moving targets in small areas, so you could 
you know, you could take some subset of the data there. So the, the, the point was um, often the moving targets will be on top of areas with a large static response. If you take so a count, it's far more likely to be a stable moving sure. than if you take a bit of static error. Yeah. This would work for a displaced and moving in cross range target to focus it up. You'd have to think, so I'll come back to it, you'd, you'd have to have some other measurements to also estimate the range direction velocity because if you start plugging something wrong into your forward model, then it won't converge. So mm -hmm. that's when the nonlinearity will really matter. But so long, so long as you can see the things that, so long as you can see that something moves, between frames, this, this should still focus them up, Is right? It because it's effectively combining the data with the correct phase shifts between image frames. But, but that's effectively what the, the, the output of this does. Um, if you can't see the, the moving target against the background, then, then this obviously won't help. Is the optimization using like Okay, and a little comparison, um, so again to the spatiotemporal total variation, and I'm not going to run through the whole video here, but just one frame, um, should be the same frame, but it looks like there's a little shift, maybe I've accidentally chosen two different ones, um, but you see there's a lot more focusing up um, by combining, essentially you get the information from the whole aperture um, rather than just the little bit. Um, that you've allowed. Okay, so what next? Well, I've made this point about realism. Uh, hopefully, I'll actually get into Dan's lab soon and, and we can collect some data and, and try this as well as some other ideas um, on something well controlled and real and a small enough data set that, that we can prototype some things and, and not just have to leave them to churn away. On a, on a large cluster. Um, it needs to include more than just the long track component. And here, I think, if you extend this to multi-static data, so there are multiple antennas, multiple receivers, um, each able to capture different components of the velocity. I think it's actually fairly straightforward to uh, recombine those different measurements. Um, but of course, if there's acceleration in the range direction, then that looks like a velocity in the cross-range direction, right? So the amount of, cross of displacement will increase throughout the image. So if something is accelerating towards you, if it's moving towards you at a constant speed, it will be displaced in cross-range. If it's accelerating towards you, it will move in cross-range. So it, it kind of needs acceleration in there as well. Okay, I, I think that's a sort of fairly iterative improvement. Um, uh, but from the mathematical side, better understanding of the nonlinearity and, and ambiguity in general for this um, for this optimization problem. So this displacement effect for one thing means that the derivatives of the of this data misfit term with respect to a velocity component are non-zero only in the wrong place. Okay, so if your current estimate of the image, the reflectivity image U, has displaced targets in it, when you differentiate your data misfit function with respect to velocity V, you end up, you have terms which are dA by dV times U, and U is only non-zero in the wrong place, potentially. So this is sort of horribly non-convex in that case. It, it's 
just not suitable um, for solving in this way at all. Maybe it's suitable for a, a sort of a, a Bayesian type approach, which is happy with uh, multiple multiple local minima. Um, also, there's a question about whether a sort of Eulerian or Lagrangian approach to describe this motion uh, is best. And here it's sort of half and half. Um, so we've got a Lagrangian description within a sub-aperture and an Euler Eulerian description that the reflectivity changes over time. right? So it's sort of somewhere between the two. And I think it's the, the Eulerian approach which is actually allowing the convergence here. Um, I, from what I've looked at so far, I, I think the inverse SAR case, so that's where you have a, you're, you're trying to image one moving target. So it is moving, and your radar is, nominally, it, it, it can be stationary. It, it could also be moving as well. Um, so you only have one velocity field, or you can extend that with acceleration and uh, roll pitch your another motion as well. I, I think in this case it would work quite well. OK. So in summary, I guess I've, I've done what I said. And what's not listed there is, is I wanted to give a talk that was somehow halfway between the, the mathematics and the engineering in, in a way that might prompt some discussion, and that seemed to work. Um, so we've, we've discussed the SAR data model and the approximations which are built in. and and are therefore going to cause artifacts, some of the things we were looking through yesterday um, in SAR imagery. Uh, briefly touched on some reconstruction approaches and dynamic reconstruction methods with optical flow and the, adaption, the adaptations I've made for these to work for moving targets in SAR. I mentioned some ongoing challenges. Um, and I'm just going to leave my acknowledgments up to say thank you to some people uh, my funders, my collaborators, and uh, the INI staff and co organize here behind the R&T program. And then I guess let's take any further questions. Yeah, Margaret has her hand up. So I, ca I can see on my screen. But, yeah. Uh, I don't know if I, Margaret, do you want to unmute yourself? Oh, sorry. I was just trying to clap. Very nice talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Is there a hand? Uh, sorry. Say, say that again. So the question was, what did I replace the optical flow condition with? Right. And the answer is, I replaced it with the thing that optical flow is a linearization of, okay? which is this brightness consistency condition, so it's equation 18 here. Okay. So I didn't linearize in a way that we then end up with all of these problems. Not linearized quite. Right, so so it's not linearized. So so this comes out of this is essentially a, a the, the first term of a Taylor expansion, right? Um, and and it's this derivative, this gradient term that needs a finite difference approximation or something on the image that just didn't seem to work. So I what I did try was sort of you know could you downsample and smooth the image and see smooth changes and it it just didn't seem to work very well. Uh, you know, it, it kind of didn't give me enough hope to persist, and I thought there's probably a better way to. Can I ask a kind of wider yeah. to that? The, the, I was thinking about that. The, this optical flow preserves <coughs> scatteringness density or, or something. Um, is, is there something better that you could try and conserve? I mean, because what's really happening is there's a thing that's moving around. 
can you capture that as a conservation law? Yeah, so you could try to preserve the edges of an object rather than its brightness itself. So its brightness probably will change throughout the SAR image anyway, as you see it through different aspects. But you're saying it moves but, but rigidly. It, but it's mo it, it, it moves, moves rigidly, but you see different aspects of it throughout that collection. So for right. some things, you won't, it won't be conserved at all, but you might conserve the location of the edges. So as long as it is a rigid object that's moving, yeah. not... And I, and I guess we're interested in rigid objects moving. So, the images that you were showing, there was a lot of black space, right? And when you're trying to solve the optical flow in there, you have a lot of non-uniqueness, because all the black part can be any movement there. So what if you put a background that doesn't move, but that is not homogeneous? Yeah, so, so that's exactly why I'm using a, a spot on so design not not to come up with a, a, full um, flow a full flow everywhere, but some points, and here it would detect two moving things yeah. and estimate their velocity, and everything else is zero. But if, I mean, if you if you do the same experiment, putting a background, then the optical. So there so there is a back. So so there isn't there isn't a background right there. There is a background of clutter, which actually you can see shifts in time, right? So on the left, the back projection. That, that's, not, that's not noise, that's physical cluster. So that's like the response from the ground. Um, but the TV regularization sort of suppresses that a lot. You can, it's hard to see on the screen. There is some amount of it still there. But, yeah. Um, what, one thing in SAR is the, the vehicles moving will obscure different bits of the ground as they go. So We've got shadowing that's changing, and, and that's not it, it conservation. Is. So right. that isn't conservation. Um, in, in fact, uh, I think one improvement that's uh, maybe you could find that out. Couldn't you? It's like uh, it's being removed because something's there. So the conservation law has an extra that, term, just, right? Yeah. Well, it, that just um, equates to putting some zeros in some rows. Rows. Of this um, walking matrix W, right? So some things won't be conserved between frames; they will have been overlapped. Uh, I have a simple, probably question. But you said several times, I think, that you think disjoint uh, pieces of the aperture. Is there any reason they have to be disjoint? Uh, so no. Uh, other than I think you have to be careful with your data misfit term here. So you need something that's still a function. So you need to physically replicate um, chunks of the data which are in, mu in multiple frames, right? Because otherwise you'll have two images, two adjacent images will be simulating the same elements of the data so when you calculate the data misfit, you, you need to be quite careful in terms of the implementation to the optimization scheme. So they don't have to be disjoint, but it's, it's much easier to implement. Yeah, it's like making a magic choice, you can take a wider aperture and move it. It's yeah, so you can. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's what you'd ordinarily look at in a, uh, in a sort of video of, of some sub aperture. But it's sort of not necessary here. Yeah. And it probably increases the computational cost because you'll be your your forward operator has more to do in each frame. Right. But you have more frames. Huh? Well, you have the same amount. And you could nominally nominally have the same amount of frames, but they'd have more data. In. Right. It, it, it depends how you want to balance it. Okay. Okay. Put this at five gigahertz, um, so it's sort of kind of a relatively low for an airborne SAR. Um, what was the integration times and the speeds of the, the target? I think some of this was there, but just trying to see sort of how it would fit with normal scenarios. So 
I, I did the mathematician's thing of, of non-dimensionalizing slow time. So slow time ranged between 0 and 1. So you can translate it however you like. And, it, and, and the simulations, because I'm simulating in a frequency domain, um, it kind of, it, there isn't an integration time. I'm just, I'm, I'm essentially doing exactly what Dan catches in his lab, which is everything is physically stationary. You can integrate as long as you want. So, so motion isn't kind of real in, in a sense there. But you could translate it up to, to whatever scenario is, is sort of interesting to you, provided you could actually capture that with a real SAR system. I'm just thinking that if most SAR images, you don't see moving vehicles, they displace out the end of the image, yeah. and you occasionally see a, a sort of bright flash or something sort of moving, that then is a, a bright line across the image. But you see the black people. blurry ships that, that it might be nice to focus them up and see what they are. They do see bulldozers moving in quarries. I, I'm not sure they're that interested in focusing up the bulldozers, but you know there, there are there are things where, where focusing up a, a moving target is, is quite a nice thing to do. We've had wine for ages. Yeah, we can do. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for